And yeah, you know, I, I'm pretty good at it. I've sold more homes in this neighborhood than anybody else. And they never even get to a why. Now, it works. There's incredible examples of it throughout our, every marketplace. Some of the best and top agents, guys who sell way more homes than I do, this is how they operate. But it's not sustainable. And it's incredibly expensive. And it's not life-giving. And the clients that you have through this method are way different than the clients that you have through this method. I'll give you an example. I just uh, competed for a, a big listing within the last few months. I competed against all the big dogs in my market. They came with their guns. You know, like guys who got way more brand power than me, way more name. If you were to drop their name to 10 people, everyone would know who they are. You drop my name to 10 people, maybe four or five would know who I am. They, they laid it all out in the line. They laid out their what, they laid out their how, and I mean on every level in there, they're, they're better than me. They can say they got better websites, they got better branding, they got better promotion, but they never ever got to the why. And it just so happens that these people that I was talking to, the why is all that mattered. They needed to know why. If you couldn't tell them why, then you were going to get their business. Here's the best part. The guy, the, the primary guy that I was competing against, who you know has all way more branding than I have, he was willing to list the home for fifteen thousand dollars less commission than I was. They cool. chose to work with me and pay a listing commission or a total commission of fifty-five thousand dollars. The next guy, who sells way more homes than me and has way more branding, was willing to do it for forty grand. Why did they pay fifteen thousand dollars more? Because they had to have that. Without that, there are people that you will not get. And you could say, well, that's fine. I, I don't need those people. But these people, these are the people who refer you business. They're your biggest supporters. They're dead loyal. They see your value. And they'll never question price because they don't make decisions based on price. They make decisions based on why. Why you do what you do. There's lots of people who make decisions based on what and how, and they want to be manipulated because they don't, they don't know anything else. They've been trained to be manipulated. And, and you want to go big branding and not know your why and never figure this out, you can get lots of people, but the loyalty stinks, price always gets questioned, and you've turned yourself into a commodity. Because the moment somebody else shows up who can do what you do for cheaper, they're going to go across the street and fill the gas tank up for less money because somebody can perform the same function for less money. Does that make sense? Can I ask a question on that? Yeah. Lots of times, I think everyone's experienced it. You know, you kind of know what happened in the meeting that you won. You won the trust or you won the loyalty. Yeah. So with that example you were giving, you would articulate the point you feel that the why was discovered or that sure. trust was won. Sure, awesome. So the question was, what happened in that meeting? When I was competing for that listing, what was the dialogue that went on that I got the business and the other guy didn't? Great question. Here, here's in a, in a kind of a nutshell what it was. I was last in, which is nice. That's, that's okay, right? It's better than first. But it, wasn't, it, was, it may have been intentional and I was last in. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Um, I was referred in by a trusted friend okay right. I'm referred in everywhere I go uh -huh. nobody calls me off a sign I don't have my name on a friggin sign I hate signs <laughs> everywhere I go I'm referred in or it's repeat business more most often night almost 90% of the time so I'm referred in conversation goes something like this you know you do you do the you know nice to meet you blah 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 I mean I kind of knew who they were they kind of knew who I was but we had no relationship leading up to that point and I know that everybody has been in their home thus far because they told me I was competing has walked in, sat down on their table, looked them in the face and said, I'm number one. <laughs> I'm the best. I do more than anybody else. I knew that because I knew who was there and I know how people talk. And when I sat down and the moment came for me to make my pitch and, and tell, tell them, why am I better? I said, I'm not the best. And quite frankly, I would have to be an asshole to walk into your dining room and look you in the eyes and honestly believe and tell you that I'm the best. 
And that's exactly how I said it. I said, there's 15 guys, just wait one second. There's 15 people in this town who can all get your home sold. And I would never tell you that I'm better than any of them. Based on you know experience and knowledge and capabilities, there's lots of people that could get the job done. I basically said, forget this. This doesn't matter. This is crap. Let's assume that you're going to work with somebody who has this figured out. What really matters is this. And I told them my why. And I said, here's what I believe. Here's how I operate. Here's how I function every day. And they said, that's somebody that we trust. That's somebody that we want to work with. And then when that happened, when that connection happened, price didn't matter. They literally said, so you, you want to charge us $15,000 more than the competition. And I was able to walk them through the process of how and why that makes sense and what we were going to do with that 15 grand in order to get our home sold. Now, a little side note, I sold the home in three weeks for 98.5% of asking price, and it happened to be the highest sale in that neighborhood in the last seven years. Okay. So that Congrats. helps too. But, you know, like that that's how the conversation went. I knew what everybody, I know what my competition comes in with. If I go in, I don't know any of you, but if I know who I'm competing with and I know how they talk, and I know how to completely undermine that. And here's the worst thing that can happen. This doesn't work on everybody. There's many people in the world who want to be manipulated. They don't want to reach that place. That's right. Uh, okay. That's great. Then we're not the right fit. That's right. What did Simon say? Our goal in life is not to do business with everybody who needs our services. Our goal in life is to do business with those who believe what we believe. Okay? I don't care about the people who want to be manipulated and coaxed and lied to and tricked. I'm not looking for that. I'm only looking for these people. These people are what helped me get my 17% ROI on my business base. These people will never help you get 17%. They're buying gas. You're a commodity. Whoever comes along that can do the same thing for cheaper, they're jumping ship the moment they have an opportunity. These people buy into you. They don't buy into what you're doing. Okay, let's, uh, I want to play the rest of this uh, video. Where did Rebecca go? Rebecca, break, oh, washroom. She's not allowed to take a washroom break. <laughs> Can I ask you a quick question then? Yeah. I read an article by Tom Hopkins a long time ago. Yeah. He said you got to discover the definite buying motive in any transaction. Do you have I know, techniques? I know the conversation, yeah. Do you have techniques when you're in front of people to find out whether the why is their motive or not, so you don't waste your time? You know, the best way I can answer that question is this. Like, I feel like those things, like those strategies and those, those topics of conversation are relevant for the agent who's operating from the outside in or the business person who's operating from the outside in. Because it's diff. like, yeah, when you operate from here to here, it's hard to crack that shell and get inside to figure out why someone's actually doing something. But when you bring this to the table and you're not giving somebody a slick sales pitch and you don't look like every other agent who's crossed their table, all of a sudden there's this softening. There's this opening up that occurs. And, and getting inside is, I, I honestly, like, I don't, it never does, it, like, I, it happens every time for me. It's just and a I, byproduct of that. When you change, people will change around you. And, and those strategies are necessary for the guy who comes in with, you know, he's got the slick clothes, he looks good, he sounds good, he knows every strategy. And yeah, people have their guard up. They're going, holy shit, I'm going to get robbed while this guy's in my house. I better be on my, on my guard. And then you've got to come up with the tactics in order to break in. And the really successful guys can do it. But when you come in with this mindset, the guard just drops instantly. Like if you guys could watch me in, in an hour and a half in someone's home, I don't have a slick presentation. I don't have a fancy binder or a PowerPoint presentation. It's one human being sitting with another human being talking about life circumstances and basically determining whether or not we share the same why. And if we don't, we get the hell out. I don't want to work with people who don't see things the way I do. And they don't want to work with me. They want to be manipulated. It's not. There's no frills. Where's Rebecca? Can we press play? I want to, I want to watch the rest of the, uh, the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay, okay. No, no problem. We're gonna improvise here. We're gonna, we're gonna improvise. Okay. We're almost. We're, we're getting towards the end here. Can you 
at my graph here. Of diffusion and innovation. Okay, Simon talks about this in the rest of the video. Maybe we won't watch it. Maybe I'll just do my best at explaining it. Everybody in our culture fits into one of these four graphs. You, you should make this for yourself. It's called the law of diffusion of innovation. We have our innovators. Okay, that's the 2.5%. We have our early adopters. That's the 13.5% of the population. We have our early majority, we have our late majority, and we have our laggards. <laughs> These people only buy touchdown phones because they have to. So anything in life, uh, phones, cars, technology, computers, they get brought to the marketplace when they're new, right? You know, new ideas, new concepts, they get, they get brought to the marketplace. And it's these people, the innovators and the early adopters, that line up for iPhones the day they become available, right? Or the night before they become available. And they pay $699 for the newest piece of technology. They buy the smart cars, the electric cars. They buy the newest and latest cool <coughs> apps and programs that are available. They set the pace for our culture. They are the influencers. These are the people that tell the rest of the world what they should buy, what they should eat, what they should drink, and how they should do it. These people, to varying degrees, can't think for themselves. They're sheep, quite literally. And they will do whatever the innovators and the early adopters tell them they need to do. Okay. Here's the problem, or the challenge. These people here make decisions based on inspiration, never on manipulation. You cannot trick innovators and early adopters into doing something. They have to believe in the why. They have to believe in the cause. Look no further than electric vehicles, iPhones, latest gadgets. I mean, you know, though you, you know those people. You have them around you in your life and you know how they think and how they operate. And when they get their iPhones, they're walking that thing around and they are so proud of it and they're showing everybody they know who has it. And and here's the irony. The guy here who buys the iPhone six the day it comes out pays six hundred dollars. Three weeks later, this guy buys the same phone for two ninety nine. Like, what the hell is he doing, right? Like, you know, why, why, why? But it's just, it's so important for the innovators and the early adopters to, to dictate our culture. They, they want to buy things that they believe in, and then they turn around and they preach to the rest of our society about what to do and how to do it. Yeah, question. You know, it, it strikes me that, yes, they, they buy in and they're, they're innovators, but on the other hand, a lot of them have so little in themselves that if they don't have the latest, I think that the latest is what makes them who they think they are. You know what I mean? Sure. So, well, I, I, are we here to are discuss their value as human beings? No, 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 <laughs> no, I, I know what you're saying. But you know what I'm saying? I just, I don't know. Just yeah. the way you're saying that, that these are the people that are okay. shaping our lives. Well, maybe they're just trying to look cool. Okay. Well, let's let's talk now about how this affects your business, and then you yeah. can tell me how you value them or how you don't value them. Okay. Okay. <laughs> so, these people only act on why. They cannot be manipulated. They have to believe in the product they're buying in. Now, they're also the people who are most likely to pay premium for what it is they want. Okay? So now when we relate this graph to the circle that we're talking about, I'll draw another circle here. You got your why, you got your what down here, and your how. Manipulation versus inspiration. You've got to inspire these people in order to buy. Now, there's we, we won't watch. Well, maybe we will put out the rest of the video so you can you can get it. 
There's a tipping point that is achieved right in here, and it's only by getting these guys. So let's hit play on the video, and then we'll expand, and it'll hit what you're talking about. Oh, sorry. And Samuel Pierpont Langley had what we assume to be the recipe for success. Here, let me, uh, yeah. just... Um, there we go. Can I skip ahead here? Mm-hmm. Yeah. be useful, too. There you go. There we go. Uh, go a little farther. A little farther. A little farther. Believe what you believe. So why is it important to attract those who believe what you believe? Something called the law of diffusion of innovation. And if you don't know the law, you definitely know the terminology. The first two and a half percent of our population are our innovators. The next 13 and a half percent of our population are our early adopters. The next 34 percent are your early majority, your late majority, and your laggards. The only reason these people buy touchstone phones is because you can't buy rotary phones anymore. <laughs> we all sit at various places at various times on the scale. What the law of diffusion of innovation tells us is that if you want mass market success or mass market acceptance of an idea, you cannot have it until you achieve this tipping point between 15 and 18 percent market penetration, and then the system tips. And I love asking businesses, what's your conversion on new business? And they love to tell you, oh, it's about 10%, proudly. Well, you can trip over 10% of the customers. We all have about 10% who just get it. That's how we describe them, right? That's like that gut feeling, oh, they just get it. The problem is how do you find the ones that just get it before you're doing business with them versus the ones who don't get it. So it's this here, this little gap that you have to close, as Jeffrey Moore calls it, crossing the chasm. Because you see, the early majority will not try something until someone else has tried it first. And these guys, the innovators and the early adopters, they're comfortable making those gut decisions. They're more comfortable making those intuitive decisions that are driven by what they believe about the world and not just what product is available. These are the people who stood online for six hours to buy an iPhone when they first came out, when you could have just walked into the store the next week and bought one off the shelf. These are the people who spent $40,000 on flat screen TVs when they first came out, even though the technology was substandard. And by the way, they didn't do it because the technology was so great. They did it for themselves. It's because they wanted to be first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe. In fact, people will do the things that prove what they believe. The reason that person bought the iPhone on the first, in the first six hours, a student sitting in line for six hours, was because of what they believed about the world and how they wanted everybody to see them. They were first. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. So let me give you a famous example, a famous failure and a famous success of the law of diffusion of innovation. First, the famous failure. It's a commercial example. As we said before a second ago, the recipe for success is money and the right people and the right marketing conditions, right? You should have success then. Look at TiVo. From the time TiVo came out, about eight or nine years ago, to this current day, they are the single highest quality product. Okay, so your question, sorry, we're that What you're saying may or may not be true. I mean, Simon even just said, he said they bought it because they wanted to be first. Now, what's their motivation or intention in that? I don't know. But it still doesn't disprove the law and the facts. Now, here's how this relates to, to, let me break this down how this relates to what we're talking about. In the example Simon's talking about, he's, he's talking about someone, you know, in a business bringing a market, or bringing a product to market, they're trying to achieve this tipping point, right? They, they need to hit these, these people so that they can hit 17, 18%, so that they can have their tipping point and take off. We're, we're in a different situation. We are our product, right? I'm selling myself, Matt, you're selling yourself, and the market penetration that that uh, Simon's talking about is not necessarily relevant in our conversation. But here's what is. We know that these people act based on the why. They don't act based on the what. 
And here's what I've learned through my nine years of experience. It's these people that are less likely to question price. It's these people that are more likely to drive more business to you on a weekly, monthly, and yearly basis. Because it's these people that are proud. When they decide to do something, they're proud that they did it because it made a statement about who they are and what they believed. That's how you achieve the 17% ROI. So you say, if I'm going to go after these people, then I have to formulate my business and my philosophy to look like this, inside out. It's okay to not do that because we've got a whole schlack load of people on the other side of society who all need to buy and sell homes. But here's what we know about them. These people are more likely to do something based on what they're told by these people. So if I've got 50 of these people in my business space, I'd rather have 50 of them than 300 of them. Because these guys drive business. These guys influence culture. These guys help people make decisions. Question? I do have a question. Yeah. You're focused on, I understand how you get your ROI because you're very selective about the people that you do business with. The question that I have is, if you do focus on the innovators and early adapters, yeah. they, they are the ones that are most inclined to influence. They're the majority and the late majority. Exactly. That being said, yeah. What, then what do I do with it, these guys? Well, yeah, I mean, does it does it not then saturate your business, or do you do you cut them and do you do you I, either train them or do you just cut them off using them? I them? love that you asked that question. I was just going to get to that. So here's what happens. Absolutely. Now I start to get early majority and late majority. I don't deal with laggards in, in into my business because they get referred in, right? They get told you got to work with Andrew. Andrew's this, but here's here's the biggest difference. These guys want to act based on the what and the how, because that's what they're trained to do. They've been manipulated their whole lives. They've been buying their shoes and their cars and their houses that way for as long as they can remember. But I didn't tell them that I was the best. I didn't tell them that I could sell their home faster, stronger, higher, whatever. I didn't tell them that I was going to move them. Their friends did. Their friends said, call Andrew because he can do this and because he can do that. So then when I sit down with these people, I'm there under a completely different premise. I haven't told them I'm Superman. I haven't told them I can accomplish anything. Bob did, or Brian did. I show up, and they go, hey, you you sold Brian's house in three weeks. I go, he told you that? I can't do that. You know, like, I completely level it, level it up, bring, and now I'm with these guys under completely different circumstances than what they're used to being with people in, and I can train them to think like this, and there's a weeding out process that happens when I meet with them in the listing appointment, in the buyer appointment, whatever it is. It's in that mo those early meetings that I'm determining whether or not we are going to be the right fit for one another. And if we are, it's because I've swayed them to think this way, so and they've so bought they bought into the why. Now that's not to say I've got you know I got 300 people in my in my business base. Do I have some of these people in there? Absolutely, but my rate at which I have them is so much lower than you everybody else. You can't train them, then you just I punt them. I take people out of my database all the time. Yeah, no, I, I realize you need to. I'm just curious in how you would have done that. So yeah. that's why you get your ROI. You've you got, you got to see, you got to understand the power is that I don't have to tell people how amazing I am. Yeah. These people tell them for me. And when you can show up under that circumstance and that premise, that is amazing. Because then when things come into question, when they say, when they go, well, Andrew, like, why are you going to do it this way? Or why are you going to charge me $17,000 when, when, when this guy's going to charge me thirteen and a half? And I go, well, all I can say is, I mean, Brian told me to come here. Brian, Brian said, you know, you wanted this. And I mean, clearly it's worked for Brian a lot in the past. And so, uh, yeah, you know, I, I can't argue that. Like, I, I am more expensive than, than this guy. And, you know, I, maybe that guy has a, has a better website than me. But, like, does it mean anything to you that Brian brought me here today? I mean, who's Brian in your life? Oh, Brian's your cousin. You trust Brian. Brian's your dad. Oh, your, your dad brought me here today. You reach into their chest, you grab their heart, and you give it a quarter turn. <laughs> and if they don't align with the way you think, then you're not working with them. Because it's not your goal to do business with everyone who needs your services. It's your goal to do business with people who believe what you believe. Yeah, no, I mean, that was just sort of going to lead into my next question because, I mean, what they're thinking, the way they think of the majority of the late early on how they even purchase or sell, that would be, you know, if they're not going to work and 
with you, or if you can't train them to work that yeah. way, it would be difficult to work with, you know, because they're, they're linemen and how they think would not be compatible with yours on how they Absolutely. I mean, I meet people all the time, but I don't end up working with them. I just turned down a listing. Yeah. This is, oh, here's a good story. Um, how much, where are we at time-wise? Because I want to leave time for Q&A. It's 11. We have half an hour. Okay, quick story, then we'll wrap up, then we'll do Q&A. So, I get referred, the, pe the story that I told you about the big sale where I competed, those people refer me into another home that's worth, you know, 1.2, 1.3 million dollars. So they, they are totally this makeup. And there's a guy in, the, on the, in their neighborhood that kind of know, and they said the guy's been trying to sell his home for years. You got to talk to Andrew. Okay, so this guy's definitely, probably late majority, okay, in terms of his makeup, how he thinks, and how he does things. I spend a lot of time with him. I spend hours with him. I meet him three separate times, and he's just not getting it. He's not getting it, first of all, that he's going to pay me 10, 15 grand more than the next guy he's talking to. He's also not getting it that I am totally unwilling to budge on the way I run my business and my marketing program. He wants me to do a this stupid newspaper spread on his house. I mean, newspapers are useless. They're, they're away. And he says, if you're going to sell my home, you have to do this. And that was the moment where I dropped my pen, I closed my binder, and I said, here's the deal. I don't think I'm the right fit for you. I don't think I can make you happy. And then I asked him this question because he's a guy who sold a lot of homes. I said, can you tell me a story, a positive real estate story from your past? Can you tell me a situation where you were happy with your agent? And he's quiet. And he fumbled over his words. And it was in that moment that I realized we're not working together. Now, here's the best part. I had the listing signed. The listing was actually already signed. He had signed it. And, you know, he'd even signed the, you know, the bigger commission and the competition. It was just the fact that he was having a hard time with the fact that I wasn't willing to do some of these marketing things that he thought were necessary and I knew didn't work. That was the deal killer. So I hand him back his contract and I said, we're not right fit for each other. Best of luck. God bless you. You know, have a nice day. The, he lists the home with somebody else two days later for a hundred grand more than I had the home listed for on the contract. Oh, my God. So like it just it's such a it's such it just shows you like you know the other guy that he's talking to was willing to do it for less he's a yes man he's willing to do whatever he says and he would add he lists the home for 1.399 and I had it listed for 1.299 like it's just you know so I almost had the guy there right I, like we were close but then there was that that defining moment where he just he I looked at him and I said you when you hire me you are hiring me you have to completely believe in what it is I'm doing. You have to surrender yourself to my business. And if you're not willing to do that, then that's great. I get it. I, I'll tell you all day long. I'm not the best. There's lots of other great options. You know, you, there's lots of people that can make you happy. But, but I'm not willing to sacrifice the principles of my business for one client. Because i got 15, 20 other people who are listed right now. They all love me. They all think my system's perfect. Why would I change for you? I just met you. I've known you for two months. Who are you in my life? Of course he did. Of course he did. Is it still for sale? Probably. Yeah, of course it is. Yeah, he hasn't sold it. Um, okay, so we're, right, we're running short on time because I talk a lot. I, I want to, I want to, I want to, uh, I'm going to say one more thing. I can leave that up, I guess, and then we'll do a Q&A. So we've talked about a lot of, you know, there's, have you any ideas, principles, disciplines, things like that. And, you know, I talked about the importance of applying them. I wanted to to read you something. This, this, this is written by somebody who I know. This guy is around 40 years of age. Um, he's got all the skill in the world. He has more skill than anybody else in this room in terms of potential and ability. And the guy has had opportunity after opportunity and he has squandered it. And the reason he has squandered it is purely, purely because he never was able to establish disciplines in his life. That's the only reason. And if he were here today, standing in front of you, he'd tell you the same thing. Uh, a couple of years ago, this guy wrote something. This is his own words, and he emailed it to me. And I want to read it to you because it's very powerful. And it's, it's, you know, lessons from people who have achieved success is one thing. But lessons from people who have achieved failure is another. Because you get it from a completely different perspective. So here's what it is. He titled it Focus. 
What if I gave all of my attention, time and energy, to one singular purpose, one goal? What results would be derived? How effective would I be? A good friend of mine said something that triggered an epiphany within me. The extent of that which is derived from the seed sown in life is in direct correlation to the following. The length of time the seed is in the soil, the care taken in tending the soil, and the efficacy of the seed itself that was sown. Keep in mind, this is, this is a real human who wrote this. I know this guy. And I look back on my life and marvel at the blindness I have labored to substantiate and maintain. For I wanted life to give me what I wanted on my terms. I wanted the luxury of little effort and great reward. How very sad for me now to come to this turn in the road where I now see that it was me who was wrong and life that was right. For life's principles are there, clearly modeled and verified by all that is created, and are completely indifferent to who will or who won't lay hold of life's teachings. Now I see why I have not experienced that which I long for in life. For I have either pulled the seed out too early before it could germinate, failed in properly tending the soil the seed was in, or simply sowed low quality seed. The choice is now before me, just as it, as it has always been. Only this time, I am willing to admit that I was wrong. This is a real life guy who his net worth is negative in the six figures. He owes everybody money. He's got all that. He's got more talent than I have. Way more talent than I have. And he's come to the awful realization that he screwed up and that all the opportunity was there before him, and that all of these principles were all there, and he knew them all. He just chose not to act and not to apply them. Very, very powerful. More powerful than hearing from a guy who's done it all right, hearing from a guy who's completely screwed up and now wishes he could go back. I'm done. in our group and, and uh, one of the things that I was thinking to myself that that's why over the years I always I always try to get everybody together so I'm always you know when I have a little party or a little get together I might have you know three or four or five of these ones I have two or three or four of the other ones and so I just I introduce them to each other and uh, you know I take them for lunch together or I take them for coffee together or I have a little party at the house and I, bring, and I mix the group up it's not just people it's my it's my early adapters and my my the guys are gonna brag me up. I get them to meet the other guys, and then I don't have to you know then I just don't have to try persuading. Okay. Questions? I'll go on the hot seat here for a bit. Um, you had a question. Yeah. Sorry, I forget your name. Paul. Oh, Paul. My question was. Um, Early on, when you were doing the 7 a.m. to 9 p.m., what yep. did your daily structure look like? In that time? Yeah, and even now, maybe. I guess it's, you know it's a lot different now, obviously. But well, I, I'll I'll speak to it back then. Are you in the early, more early yes. stage of your career? Okay. So, um, I mean, my structure was I got there early and and I left late. But I'll say this: I was very intentional about surrounding myself with people that are better than I am, or better than I was. Um, so, um, you know, I made sure that uh, probably every day or almost every day, I was in the presence of somebody who I could learn something from um, and glean something from. That was that was like priority number one for me. Why did you take that down and delve a little bit more about your activities in the in the early days? How did you? How, how did you? Yep. How did you? What did you do in all those hours? And uh, how did you get the business going? So when you have, when when you're when you're new or newer, or even if you're not newer, if you're just having a hard time filling your time because you you know you don't have enough buyers, you don't have enough lister or sellings, or you know listers, and you're not doing deals, you've got time. 
and so I was I I forced myself to use my spare time uh, in activities that I was either going to be in contact with people on a regular basis or I was going to put myself in situations where business could come my way. And you know what? Like, I mean, so things like door knocking. I did door knocking. I spent time in coffee shops. I talked to people who are perfect strangers to me. And, you know, it's the, 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 um, the effectiveness of those activities are fairly low in comparison to the things that I can do today. But, of course, in that season of life, I could not do the things that I can do today because I did not have the platform that I have today, right? So I, I, I would never door knock today, but I don't have to door knock today. I've got other, I got better things I can be doing with my time. But when I have extra time, I'll get you in one sec. Um, you know, I, I made sure that I was always in environments where I was encountering new people, encountering the possibility of business. And then if not doing that, I'm putting myself in a situation where I'm having coffee or having lunch with somebody that I can learn something from. And it's just, you know, it's uh, you, you know, it's all about putting yourself in the right place, putting yourself in the right environment. I mean, the, the, the worst thing you can do is sit around at your desk and feel sorry for yourself and, and, and you know, hum and haw or, or you know, the, I'll tell you this. Here's the other thing I did. I did not allow myself to go home between the hours of 7 a.m. and 5.30, period. Because going home lends itself too much to watching TV, screwing around on the internet, dicking around with my wife, which can be fun, but that's not what I want to do during the day. So, you know, I said, I'm going to be working from 7 to 5.30, hopefully from 7 till 9.30, but I'm going to be working. I'm not going home. And so I'm out in my community. <coughs> so, like, you know, some, I didn't always get it right. Sometimes I'm screwing around on my computer at the office, but at least I'm at the office. At least I'm around other agents who are great agents and I can observe them and watch them and things like that. See, you know, people, I, I watch new agents all the time, you know, like they come into the office and I'm like, oh, what are you doing? Where, where are you working? Oh, I got a home office. Oh, yeah, that's great. You're going to fail. <laughs> home office is, I mean, I know it's cheaper and I know, you know, you're watching your costs and I, but, but like, I mean, if you're a new agent, you need to have your ass in the office as much as you can. If you're not meeting with people, you need to be in the office. And now, sure, I try to be out of the office as much as I can. I don't want to be in my office because I'm not making money there. But when you're in the position when you don't have a whole lot to do, it's a matter of measuring what is the most effective use of your time in that moment. And it's better to be in the office around people who are doing great things than be at home sulking because you haven't done something. Next question. Um, oh, let me get, let me get, there was one in the back. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, you have to speak up. I want to be really crystal clear about what it was you were doing in your early days and it was building a database with anyone and everyone to filter out and find? No, uh, no, no, no. That lesson, this, this last thing we talked about, I only learned this lesson about three or four years ago. Okay? So we went through chronologically my career and, and I, I, we discussed a few. There was one thing we didn't even get to today. I was going to talk about cost and value proposition and how you determine what you're worth. I mean, we, did, we, we ran out of time. but. Um, this, this was not until at least three or four years ago um, that I, you know, that I learned this. And, you know, so early on in my career, um, I mean, I was in a different environment. I was working in a team setting. I didn't have complete control of what I was doing. I mean, I was looking to other leaders in my life to, to dictate how I would run my business. And so th in that moment, it was less about database management and systems management. It was all about what are my daily activities? What am I doing today that's going to have the best chance of making me successful? You know, uh, um, there are things definitely, had I started on my own, which I know many of you are, I mean, yeah, I look back and there's things where I go, geez, I, I wish I had done it this way. I wish I had paid more attention to the philosophy and the database management and the management of people earlier on in my life. Um, hopefully you guys do do it long before I did. Um, but I didn't. I only learned these lessons a few years ago, and so I, I, I think the, the benefit, I mean, I can say that the benefit of the environment I was in is I, I encountered more and did more so quick that I gained so much real life and business experience uh, for such a young guy who, who really didn't, you know, who really didn't, didn't know, didn't know much, right? But I mean, that was also a product of the environment. The market was hot. I mean, I could be in a team setting today. I mean, I know there's many of you on team settings today, and you're not doing a ton of deals. You're not getting a ton of business and opportunity. And, um, and you know, it's, it was a product of the environment.
Yep. Um, just a follow up then, uh, what would you do differently, knowing what you know today, what would you do differently in the phase one? Well, for the situation I was in, I mean, probably nothing. But I mean, you know, that that's probably a question that I need to, that there's a different answer depending on who I'm talking to. Because everyone's circumstances are different. And I mean, I would never take lightly um, how well things went for me in the first few years. I would never want to say, oh, you know, that was a mistake. I mean, it was, it, it was what it was. It, it was, you know, a lot of things were just a product of the environment and it went the way it did and it, the way, when it, it went the way it did. And yeah, I could look back and say, oh, I wish I had done that or I wish this person had helped me with that. But I mean, then there's like, th then there's a domino effect. If you don't do something that you think you regret, then something else doesn't happen as a result of it. So, uh, you know, I think if I started on my own, things would have been different for me and I would have had to do things differently. And I could have back then, and sure, sometimes I go, you know, it, it would have been different. I maybe would have liked it better in the long term, but in the short term, that support and that coaching and that, that environment I was in was fantastic. And it was, it was great for that moment.